Hey, this is Jackie here with the Sexy Politico. I'm here today to talk about talking with Laura Hartley. Laura, your your expertise, your specialty is um quite multifaceted, and I think you would you would be better to explain it than I can. Could could you start off by tell telling people a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So I am an activist, a coach, and I run an online school for change makers. So most of my work and what I talk about really deals with this intersection of inner and outer change. You know, how do we create a more just world, a more regenerative world? And what are the conditions within us that need to change to help create that? So a lot of uh, the courses and programs that we run are in healing burnout cycles in culture, because for anybody interested in activism or politics, burnout is rampant. Looking at internalized capitalism, what it means to get free of these systems around us, exploring our relationship to power, getting comfortable with it, and figuring out really what is ours to do in this time? What's our role in remaking the world? Can you define capitalism and anti-capitalism for people who just hear these words and think that they're just buzzwords yeah absolutely so you know capitalism is an economic system but it also has uh cultural social and political threats to it so as much as it is an economic system it's also an ideology today as well and that's really the space that i work in and that i'm talking about the the beliefs that shape capitalism. And, you know, when we're talking about capitalism, particularly, you know, from an anti-capitalist or post-capitalist perspective, there's kind of three major problems with it that we identify. So the first is the pursuit of infinite growth on a finite planet. It's why we say it's the leading driver of the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. The second is that embedded within capitalism is this artificial production of scarcity. You know, and when I say artificial, I mean uh, planned obsolescence. We design products to die now, like nobody expects their phone or their fridge or anything they buy to last. We see it in marketing, we see it in the, uh, the creating scarcity to encourage innovation you know, in our societies. And the third problem, of course, is this kind of devaluation of beautiful, complex living systems like forests and uh, oceans and jungles to lifeless resources. They don't have value unless there's something that humans can extract from them. And that might be tourism, it might be timber, but it's still some sort of human use of it. So these are the three problems with capitalism. And then obviously looking at anti-capitalism, post-capitalism, we're just like, how could we create a system that maybe doesn't encourage scarcity so much, doesn't um, devalue the living earth, that actually lives and works within the planetary boundaries. And so that's the kind of external perspective. Now, last week, Last week, I was having a discussion with uh, with the makeup historian about how women's bodies have become a commodity within within capitalism and talking about how over the years and with makeup and things of that nature. And it's really interesting when you get into the nitty gritty of some of some of these ideas about capitalism and just the human body in general. I mean hell i gave birth to two children there's capitalism and birthing i mean four letter word there's i mean come exactly. on, your baby registry list yes you know I, I think capitalism has a tremendous ability to kind of um consume anything that really tries to disrupt it that tries to subvert it and, you know, there's a million ways that, you know, capitalism is so prevalent now that we've internalized it into our psyches as well. So like when I'm using the term internalized capitalism, um, and I didn't coin this term, uh, I'm no, actually not sure who did, I can't remember their name, of course, but like it is this idea, it's the equation of our worth with our productivity. You know, it's the equation of our worth with what we produce. And so what happens? We get sick, we keep going into the office, we keep working, even if it's from home. You know, even when we have COVID, we're still like, no, we've got to like tap away at this computer and get this thing done. We feel like we're never doing enough. And so, you know, we're, we're cooking and we're multitasking on our phone and we've got children in the background. We've got this happening over here. And then, of course, uh, we experience time scarcity as well. This feeling that there's like never enough time. You know, we're just going to power through this meeting today. We've got a lot to fit in or, you know, oh, the weekend was great, but it wasn't long enough. You know, it never is. And so we have this really uh, scarce relationship to the world 
And of course that manifests in a huge amount of ways. And these are just ways that we've internalized systems and culture that's around us. As a stay at home mom in this, in this climate, I, 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 I hear everything you're saying and I'm like, yes, absolutely. I don't, I, I don't traditionally work. And yet I constantly feel like I'm not doing enough. Yeah. And so many of us do that perfectionism, that like not good enough syndrome is the similar principle, right? That we're not enough, that we're not doing enough, that there is not enough. If my house isn't clean enough, that means that I'm not valued because I mean, what else? I'm not making money so that, so that my value is the home and my kids. And my husband reminds me some days, he's like, are they happy? Did they eat? We good. Exactly. Yeah. And I think this it's is like, as long as they're about. fed, as long as they're fed, they're, we're good. <laughs> you know, this, this kind of redefining what success is, like redefining actually what's meaningful, what feels good. You know, so often I think we have lost today this ability to know even what enough even feels like. Mm. Like I, I say it personally in diet culture, that's one of the major ways that I've internalized this, you know, spent a long time, like years on and off of diets and this sense of like, actually, well, what is my body's intuitive set point for enough? What is it? When, when do I know when I'm hungry? When do I know when I'm satiated, when I'm satisfied? And this is just one way that it's that idea of scarcity coming through. So how could we take a look, an honest look at ourselves and our, and what, how do we know what our actual motivations are and how do, and how does that actually really, like, how do we know what our motivations really are and are, are most of our motivations related to capitalism? Oh gosh, this is such a good, good question. Um, you know, I think there is an unlearning period to go through of really like challenging all of those things that our mind says that we should do. Like every time we hear that, like, yeah, okay, but like my house should be cleaner or like, yeah, but you know, the movement is struggling. There's not enough people doing the work. I should step up. Like every time there is a should, we need to challenge that and really actually interrogate for a little bit. Is that true? You know, what would happen if it wasn't true? Um, why am I so uncomfortable? with this feeling here that I feeling that I'm having to make myself do something. And so once we've done enough work of unlearning, and of course there's other areas we can look at there, we can start to kind of find a different compass. And for me, you know, the, the clearest, easiest compass is the body. You know, the body does not lie. Uh, to give you an example, a couple of, a little while ago, I signed myself up. I had some friends who were part of a climate movement and they were handing out some newsletters and they did a call out just to help do like some letterbox drops. And I was like, sure, you know, I haven't done anything for ages. I would really like to get back involved. This is a easy way to fit in with my life right now. Before long there, I realized it wasn't just letterbox dropping that I could do like, you know, of an evening or on my walk or something. It was like, there were like four hour shifts and buddy systems and, mm. you know, you had to turn up at a specific time and place. And I was like, okay, wow, this is not for me. And everything in my brain said, okay, but you said you would do this. So you should, you should honor your commitment there. Um, you know, you, you wanted to be part of this again, like all of this, but my body just felt heavy and exhausted and the thought of now putting this structure into my life was just like weighing on my shoulders and the moment I actually was like you know what? I'm so sorry this wasn't quite what I thought I signed up for happy to recommend this to some other people I know who'd love to get involved uh, but I don't have capacity at the moment there was this lightness you know there was expansion there was ease and so the body there was really telling me no matter what my mind said my capacity was no matter what my should was you know that i should always be doing more my body was like you do not have the space for this right now and honoring that is part of the way out of these burnout cycles part of the way that we kind of uh find our new path forward you know as a collective and as individuals sorry i'm just listening to everything you're saying and i'm like man, man i really needed to just talk to you <laughs> but <laughs> any so why does somebody who is similarly motivated to myself and i'm i'm guessing you as well feel like that they need to they need to save the world you hear these you hear these individualistic goal 
quotes and things. It's like one person can change. One person can't really change the world. You need a you need a collective. But why do you feel? Why do we feel like we need to change the world? Oh gosh, I mean, you know, I think there's two sides to this question. You know, one like. The world is kind of burning, you know, when we look at it, there is a lot of urgent problems right now, you know, the climate crisis being a major one, racial injustice that's, you know, ongoing in so many places, um, you know, the increasing wealth inequality that we're seeing, there's a lot of things that need our attention and they need our attention, you know, now. But the issue is, you know, a lot of us, we're trying to make change within the same paradigm that we currently exist in, you know, so we're trying to you know, capitalism is a great example. I know a lot of people trying to disrupt or subvert capitalism that are saying it's the you know, driver of the climate crisis and they're still burning themselves out working in a way that's related to internalized capitalism. So until we start to kind of get free of those systems, it's difficult to, to stop fighting the old and actually also allow something new to emerge between us. But the other part of that question, you know, which is why do we think we need to save the world? there's a lot of hero narratives that we're sold you know we're, we're told about it's you know david versus goliath that it's you know now or never that we all need to stand up and and to an extent these are true but there are other stories that we can also use to make change from and they're just not as well told they're, they're not as uh sold to us in the media quite as much and these are stories of community they're stories of care they're stories of love they're stories of service and when we start to kind of look at what stories are true for us, you know, if I don't have to save the world, if I don't have to fix it, but maybe I just want to love it, what would that look like? What would be different? You know, maybe I'd still be doing the same work. Maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't. And what, what's in that space? And that for me is a really interesting idea to start to play with. What can we do in the short term to deal with with burnout in general and what would be a long-term solution we could move forward with mm. <laughs> or is sure. that a too individualistic no I, I think you know there is the thing about burnout is that there is individual work there absolutely is and there is collective work you know and the especially if we are experiencing burnout ourselves Ourselves, that individual work needs to come first. You know, that is where we start because it is about healing our nervous system, healing our bodies, setting boundaries in our lives. So, you know, for anybody who is struggling with burnout, I think that first step is actually really taking a pause, you know, checking in with our bodies. So many of us, like, we're so, we live very neck up and we don't even know what's kind of happening from our shoulders down. You know, we ignore that the, the butterflies in our stomach or the knots in our back. So, like, tuning in with them, like really asking them, like, what are you trying to tell me? Like setting some boundaries in our lives, being able to say no and taking a break so that you can regain some sense of energy that you can start to move forward from. Like when you've hit peak burnout, that is where it is. Then as we, you know, we kind of move on from there and as we start to really re-examine, make different choices in our lives because burnout is not something we can solve with, you know, a gratitude journal or a patch or, a, you know, if we just meditate five minutes a day, it's great, love it, do it myself, but it's not the fix. Then we can start to look at the collective work. We can start to look at the cultures of our organizations, of our movements, um, of our family groups, you know, look at what do we value collectively? Who do we want to be with each other? How do we want to be with each other? Are we creating spaces for a genuine real check-ins? Not just like a ticket off because it's on the agenda, but like, hey, really, how are you doing right now? What do you need? What would genuine collective care look like between us? But that work definitely comes later when we're resourced. You know, that first stage, I really think it's just reconnecting to the body and setting that space to re-examine our lives. I feel like when people, at least in the United States, talk about burnout, they they really talk about it as just being overwhelmed with work. And in reality, there's a you could be burned out in a lot of different places. And sometimes you can't actually just, you know, you can't go on vacation from being a parent. And there are and I I don't know about other stay-at-home moms, but I've definitely had those. I've realized that when I start yelling at my four-year-old and my husband's like looking at me in a way that's like, I'm like, 
maybe I need to go and work on my cross stitch because this is what I do with my hands to focus on something other than my brain. I love it. But you think that's so true. I, you know, I think the official definition of burnout, like by the WHO or something is actually like, oh, it's related to like workplace exhaustion type thing. But it's not like the, all the activists I've known, my own experiences, that was totally unpaid work that we were burning out from. You know, as you're saying, it, it, parents, stay at home parents, so many people over, over the pandemic have experienced burnout. You see it in every single industry now. And there's a reason for that. And it's not just because of one workplace and it's not just because as individuals, we like had some resiliency deficit or, you know, there was something wrong with us. It's our entire culture. You know, we don't live in a world that is made for our well-being. And the only way to start remaking it for our well-being is to start, you know, resourcing ourselves first and then resourcing our communities so that we can recreate it. How much of this is social media induced? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. You know, I, look, that, it's an interesting perspective. I think a degree, definitely. Like, I don't think social media helps things. And I don't think it is the cause of burnout. I think burnout existed long before it. It will exist, you know, throughout it, potentially beyond it, whatever its future is. But at the same time, when we're constantly looking online and we're either getting news Very. alerts that are keeping our nervous system like in hypervigilance, like we're just like, oh my God, another terrible thing that's happened. Or we're comparing exactly our friends are like, we're like, look, she has it all together. Like, look at these amazing photos. It's pretty easy to then kind of put more pressure on ourselves that we should be more resourced, that I should have more energy, that I should be happy, whatever it might be, rather than actually, you know what? Life is complex and life is nuanced. And maybe there's challenges in my life right now that they're not experiencing and vice versa. I, I wonder sometimes that what my children are going to deal with in 10, 12 years, no matter how much I want to protect them from social media, they're going to go on whatever the social media looks like. And I'm sure the, the climate crisis is still going to be ongoing that there's, well, they live in the United States, the gun control issue is still going to be a thing. And I just wonder how much they're going to feel like they're they're worthless because they didn't get started sooner. Because you see these five, six, seven year olds who are already activists, and it's like, I how do you prevent? It almost feels like pre burnout is going to start happening soon enough. Yeah, you know, and I like I'm so simultaneously amazed by this new generation that's coming up and how young some of them are getting engaged in activism and and I applaud it and I think it's a wonderful thing and yeah I also kind of share some of those concerns as well because you know it's a young age to be that concerned about the world and to have this kind of weight on your shoulders but it doesn't and I suppose actually that's the phrase there it doesn't have to be a weight like I think the trick there and the key is really is empowering us at our age and obviously the young ones as well with the skills to show up for the world to follow what is theirs without feeling that they need to fix absolutely everything without feeling that the future is hopeless you know without feeling that there's this burden on their shoulders and theirs alone and that is that's a skill as much as like it, it's not something that's inherent really to anyone i think it's something that we learn through practices and through reflection coming back to okay well this is what i'm feeling having that emotional awareness this is what's happening in the world this is all i've learned to examine all these shoulds in my mind and this is the path that i'm going to follow because this is what brings me meaning and this is what my values are how how do we as individuals figure out our potential for change making? Mm. Now, this is a big question. I think there's, it comes back to that compass thing that I was kind of talking about. You know, we have our body compass. Um, that's one place that we can look to get some insight as to what kind of feels right for us. But we also have, you know, our callings, those little voices that every single one of us has that says, 
yeah, you know, but that thing you've been thinking about starting for like, you know, five years now that keeps coming in the back of your mind that I keep ignoring, um, that, that's a calling, you know, that thing is supposed to be followed. And the more that we do start to follow those things, the more that other opportunities appear. So understanding that those are two compasses there, and then we have our values, really getting clear on what are my intrinsic values? What do I, what gives me meaning? What matters to me? What do I want my legacy to be? When we can bring all three of these kind of pieces together, we have a path forward. We have some clarity as to where we want to go next. Because don't get me wrong, the world needs activism. You know, it absolutely does. I am an activist. I applaud every single activist out there. And we also need people revolutionizing their fields in banking. We need people revolutionizing farming. We need people looking at energy use. We need people who are challenging some of the education system. So we need people in every single field doing their piece. So it's not that nobody should be doing it all or we all should be doing one thing. It's figuring out what is ours. And that's where the compasses come in. My my husband and I were discussing, I have, you know, we have older family members, younger family members, and it feels as though Gen Z is very focused on the climate crisis. And he was like, well, what was, he was like, what was our thing as millennials? And I'm like, it was, it was gay rights and gay marriage. And it it's almost feels as though every generation sort of has this collective idea of the thing that they need to fix and then when it's fixed because nothing's ever completely fixed then we move then we move on to the next thing like okay we're done now let's move on and so my I sort of wonder what's going to come next because mm. although the global climate crisis has been ongoing I remember selling save the ocean t-shirts and being told that there was a giant hole in the ozone layer in australia i don't even know how much that was true and... definitely true a lot of us closed up um oh you know, cool. I, good to know the... they like... actually they did very well on that one because like you could kind of just ban certain aerosols and it made a big difference it was a very easily it was an easy solution within capitalism like, um, oh, good we we closed the hole in the ozone layer with our with all the t-shirts that we bought with ocean animals on it but you know the climate crisis i think you know it, it will continue there's a certain degree of warming that is already locked in and yeah. at this stage it's how bad do we want it to be and so i think the the future will really be there's so many things underpinning the climate crisis it's not just uh fossil fuels fossil fuels absolutely are like the driver of the emissions but you gotta look at well where does capitalism play into this where does colonialism play into this where does our separation from the natural world play into this and so there's a lot of different layers that also go into this let alone you know when we start talking about climate Sorry. justice but yeah you know like when we start talking about climate justice you know and the fact that disproportionately like uh the global south uh indigenous people are disproportionately impacted by the climate crisis compared to the actual um element that they contribute that they contributed so there's a lot of different facets to it and i think that it is the defining crisis of you know, our lifetimes and probably the next mm. few, but it will unravel and evolve in different ways that will call for different work in different spaces still. So each, each generation will still have their moment, their movement, but I definitely think this will play a large role in what is to come. Yeah, I think that, I think that one thing that needs to be really focused upon is that the social media likes to focus on like these small parts of the climate crisis like at least in the u.s you see you the the plastic straw thing and then and it was like oh we saved we saved all the tortoises because we've banned plastic straws and then the dis then the disability people who are disabled are like but we need plastic straws Oh gosh, I mean, it's only like this, this year, I think that, you know, my state in Australia has decided to like ban single use plastics. And it's like taking that long to even do that. And you know, here's the thing, these conversations need to happen. Should single use plastics be a thing? No, 
uh, are there exceptions for you know people with certain disabilities or people who um, have certain requirements? Absolutely. You know there is no zero sum, one size fits all answer for the entire world. And these conversations do matter because you know the amount of straws that end up in the ocean is kind of disturbing. And what they do, yeah. there is a huge problem with that. And it is just an easy answer as well. Um, I think to focus on that kind of fits still within the world as it is, you know, the world as it is can still exist without straws. But what I'm really interested in is, you know, what is the world as it could be? What is the world as we could imagine it if we could remake it? You know, every element of the world today was shaped by imagination, by somebody else's imagination. And their imagination didn't include the well being of all. So, what if we started to really picture that to imagine what our communities would be like what our our cultures would be like what would actually be different and that's i think creates a space for a wider change but it's also kind of deeply disruptive to the status quo yeah it's it's kind of hard to change the status quo when you're not even sure if you want to if you're like i, I want to make the world a better place but do i want to change every single part of my life yeah, and, and you know, it's a journey. I, yeah, I don't think that everyone need, it's not like going to live off grid in the mountains is the answer. Like for some for some small degree of people, it probably is and credit to you, go amazing, live your life. Um, but it's not for me. You know, I like living in the inner city. I like being surrounded by people, um, but it is well looking at well, step-by-step, step. you know, from a personal level, like what is my participation in the food systems around me and how can I challenge that? How can I um, reimagine my travel and, and start to limit my use there or just you know, travel a bit differently? You know, what is most important to me? What's the culture of like my, my organization and where I work? How can I start to like change that emphasis off productivity and onto relationality? So there's lots of spaces that we can make change that isn't necessarily like overhauling our lives and going to live in the woods yeah well the woods are nice around here i don't want to live in them the woods are beautiful i do i do love my nature days i love to get outside but yeah not not to live yeah now i mean up here where i live there's a lot of hunting this is not a safe time of the year to go out into the woods without a without a lot of protective gear <laughs> yeah that, i would find that a little bit terrifying <laughs> seriously but then honestly around here hunters hunters feel like they at least know more about where their meat is being processed where it comes from than any than most people do because they're they're like i shot my deer i took it i took it to bob who processed processed every single bit of it yeah absolutely and, and this is the thing like you know there is potentially a space for that you know for as long as we're like again quotas endangered like make sure we're not like yeah. trophy hunting type thing but like why we are so removed from where our food comes from especially you know anybody who eats meat like we're very we don't even think about it as animals we call it something else or it's packaged so differently it's it's hard to relate it back to the life that it actually lived so you know for hunters you know if, if that's a thing and that's something that they're comfortable with and it's within the kind of natural planetary boundaries it's a good opportunity for them now my uh one of my relatives would thought it was weird and hilarious when my son's like i'm eating a cow and they're like why would he say that i'm like well because i'm not going because he, he needs to know that his hamburger is a cow yeah he's yeah. like i'm it, eating a cow but it's like, it's even yeah. knowing what's in season like i didn't grow up knowing what foods were in season it's like been confusing to me sometimes as an adult like to figure out like oh okay of course that's why i can't get that right now or why it's like shipped in from i don't know china or venezuela like because it's out of season right now it's like it should and be the craziest thing in the world to get bananas in michigan period and then crazier to get it in november yes exactly so and these are all little things that we can start to reevaluate these are small choices. You know, we need larger system change, absolutely. But 
Creating that larger system change also means challenging our participation in the system. The ways we've internalized it in our psyches, the ways we participate it through our actions, and then looking at, well, okay, now how can I create influence for this larger sphere as well? Which is where social media can be a good thing, as long as you, limit's not the right word, but know your yeah, own limits, maybe. Yeah, as long as there's a healthy relationship and it's hard because the companies are not designing it that way. You know, they design it for addiction. They, it's so endlessly scroll and I am so prone to this myself. Mm -hmm. So creating until, you know, again, we have a culture and a world and organizations that care for our well-being and foster a social media that's actually good for us, creating those limits within ourselves so that we're not falling into the hole and we're able to have some boundaries. I love that my my expensive my expensive phone with it with a fruit on the back has l puts limit allows me to put limits on social media. It's like one giant tech conglomerate is trying is teaching me how to put limits on other giant tech conglomerates that. Uh, I, you know, I hadn't framed it that way, and that is so true. And I love that because I have I have limits on my iPhone as well, and I'm just like, yeah, no, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Like, can't so, limit my actual phone use, yeah. but I can limit my apps. <laughs> yeah, because I need to, because TikTok is evil for me. Oh, TikTok is like, I mean, I love it. And yeah, it is a rabbit hole. Like, they it, have like, and my stuff goes into parenting TikTok and it makes it either makes me angry or makes me feel like the like the worst parent in the world because there's they have some weird phrases about certain things with children like you shouldn't put your kid in any sort of a container which includes strollers pack and plays and it's like ooh, sometimes I'm... I need to pee and know that my kid isn't going to try to climb the stairs yes you know it, it, again there's no one size fits all here yeah. so like, my four-year-old isn't gonna watch him <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly he's, you know, he's for, not for tiktok at me it goes down the lovely like queer funny vibes or mm -hmm. the like very like uh colonialism and educational vibes and it's amazing how well they get to know you uh -huh. in a very small amount of time or watching the 30 seconds of different tv shows and then they're like oh you like doing that it's like no i was just curious <laughs> yeah but like i don't need to see this every second video anymore but these are, you know, this is social media is again, it's a reflection back to us, right? So the things that it is showing us is kind of like it's, it's getting smarter and it's learning about us. Which so is when scary. we're seeing things that, yeah, it's terrifying on one level, absolutely. But it can also be an insight. You know, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm reinforcing into my mind. This is what is shaping my beliefs. Okay, what if I were to actually put this down for a little bit? What if I were to look deliberately at other things? What if I were to just um, put it away and start to really see if I can reinvigorate my own creativity, my own imagination for a little bit? Because it is just a mirror in a sense. Yeah, it really is. Well, so is there a message you would like to end today's podcast with before before uh zoom kicks us off um oh gosh it's you know i i've loved this conversation and i'm really grateful to be on here so thank you for having me on here the main message i suppose for anybody is interested in figuring out their path in change making is interested in doing the inner work or is struggling with burnout you're welcome to go check out my website which is laurahartley.com and i'm also pretty active on instagram at laura.h.hartley as we talk about social media and its pitfalls um but go all and the check links them out will and... all the links will be in the show notes bio what whatever it's called and whatever app you're using and then, yeah, let's, you know, let's all of us, each and every one, remake the world and let's get free of this um, internalized constructs around us. Thank you so much for being on the Sexy Politico today. Um, everybody, all the links to Laura's uh, everything will be in the bio, will be in the show notes and bio down below. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Have a great, have a great rest of your day. Bye.